Hello folks, today it's time to strut our stuff. No, I'm not talking about the fashion runway. Our stuff is an aerospace structure and we're constraining it using struts. Today we're going to be talking about strut assemblies and structures, or as I like to call them, minimally constrained structures. These are pretty common in aerospace applications. For example, here's some minimally constrained strut assemblies on the Apollo Lunar Module from over 50 years ago. And here's more on the Curiosity and Perseverance Mars Rover Descent Stage from within the last few years. Anywho, in this video I'm going to discuss what exactly a minimally constrained structure is and what the advantages and disadvantages are. Then I'm going to show an example of a minimally constrained mock structure that I designed and finally go through a Python tool I created for calculating the internal strut forces in the assembly. So what the heck is a minimally constrained structure? Well, it's exactly as the name would suggest. A structure that supports something using the exact minimum number of constraints needed to fully fix it in space. Allow me to introduce the concept of degrees of freedom. A degree of freedom is a discrete transformation that can be executed on a body to change its position or orientation. Look at this square. It's a nice square, probably one of my favorite shapes around. Anyways, this square, living on a plane, can move left or right and up or down. That's two degrees of freedom, but remember, the square can rotate. So a 2D object actually has three degrees of freedom. But we don't live in a 2D world, we live in a 3D world. Let's consider a cube, which, might I add, is a way better shape than a square. The square was vastly overrated and is probably my least favorite shape. The cube can also move up, down, left, and right, but it can now move forward or back. Additionally, we've added two more ways it can rotate, both around the vertical axis and the horizontal axis, for a now total of three directions it can rotate. Therefore, every 3D object can translate in three directions and rotate in three directions, meaning there's a total of six degrees of freedom. Getting back on track, a minimally constrained structure is one that exactly constrains the six degrees of freedom, no more or no less. There are a few ways to do this, but a common method is to use struts. Guess how many struts you need to minimally constrain a structure? If you said 493, you'd be grossly wrong, but if you said six, that's right. One strut constrains one degree of freedom. Why is that? Well, let's investigate the anatomy of a strut. A typical strut is going to be a tube connecting two points on either end. In actuality, what's between the two points is completely irrelevant, only the distance between them that matters. A strut would still work the same whether it's an aluminum tube or Hercules holding two ball joints at the same distance. So what are these ball joints? Well, they're joints that fix position but still allow rotation. Here's an example of a ball joint constrained in a clevis. This particular application of the ball joint is called a rod end. If we section this joint, you can see there's a bolt going through, clamping the bushing and the ball to the clevis. Thus, the position of the whole rod end is fixed. However, because of the ball, the rod end and rest of the strut can still rotate in all three directions. Also, while we're on the topic of rod ends, another common ball joint are the spherical bearings, which don't have threads and instead are pressed or swaged into a tight tolerance hole. This makes manufacturing more difficult and removes the length adjustment available to rod ends. However, the main benefit is typically a bit more strength for the same rough size as well as being able to take side loads. Side loads are almost never a thing on simple struts, but sometimes it's convenient to combine multiple struts into one point, which will be putting the rod end and its threads in bending. On some structures, you'll even see struts that don't have ball joints at all and are just pins. These can still be pseudo-minimally constrained because the stiffness of all the struts in tension or compression is much, much higher than any of them in bending. Anyways, let's get back on topic. If we zoom out, the strut has a rod end at both ends. If we put whatever it is that we're mounting on the top and the bottom rod end is fixed, you can visualize why one strut only constrains one degree of freedom on the body. The body can still travel left, right, forward, or back, and the strut will rotate along with it. Also, the body can still rotate around all of its three axes since the ball joint at the top allows rotation. But what if we try to pull it up or push it down? Look at that, we can't. The strut can't extend or contract, so it's now fixed in the up or down direction. 
or more precisely, if the strut was rotated at some random angle, it's fixed in the direction of the strut. So one strut constrains one degree of freedom, and if you add five more friends, then you fully fix the body. Quick caveat though, not every configuration of the six struts works. Firstly, the struts must mount to a minimum of three separate points on both the body and the ground. If you have all six struts coming from the same point, it's just going to fall over. Second, your strut setup must have each direction represented in some way. If you orient all of your struts in the same way like this, again, your structure is just going to fall over. Okay, now you hopefully have a good idea of what a minimally constrained structure is and how it works. Now the question is, why use them? Well, there are a number of advantages and disadvantages. Let's start with the disadvantages. The biggest disadvantage is that a minimally constrained structure is not redundant. It's what's known as a single point of failure structure. Because the body is only constrained using the exact number of struts needed, if any one strut or joint fails, then the whole structure is now unconstrained and can move around. Other struts will probably bottom out and bend as the system settles to a new position, which will most likely result in more failures and probably a total loss of the structure. For that reason, you need to be extremely careful when designing and building the structure to ensure its adequacy. Another disadvantage is that it can create load concentrations on the structure and potentially reduce stiffness. Instead of just bolting the body directly to the ground in a bunch of places, all of the load goes through only three to six points where the struts are attached. Therefore, the structure may be a bit more difficult to design and have stress peaks around the mounting points. And finally, the last reason is that it's both more expensive and more parts than just, again, omitting the struts and bolting it down. With these disadvantages in mind, why do it at all? There are a number of scenarios and structures which are great for minimally constrained assemblies, one of which is highly pressurized fuel tanks. You can see them here on the lunar module. Just like a balloon, even titanium fuel tanks expand when they are pressurized, and a strut structure that is minimally constrained will adapt to the shape of the body. If the tank is expanding or contracting, the struts will literally move along with it. Check out a finite element simulation of a fuel tank I made a while ago. It's expanding and contracting, exaggerated slightly so we can see it, and the struts are swinging with the expansion of the fuel tank. If the tank was rigidly attached between a structure, immense stresses would build up as the expanding tank fights against its mounts. Another use is something like sensitive electronics equipment that you want isolated from the rest of the vehicle. You can even put dampeners in the struts to eliminate vibration or high frequency loads going into the electronics. Seats are another example. Note the Apollo seating assembly is suspended on struts with impact attenuating capabilities. Moving assemblies are also a great candidate. Changing the length of any of the struts can change the position of the body. And lastly, a benefit for the engineers and designers, Minimally constrained structures are fully deterministic, meaning the load in every strut is fully certain and calculatable without the need for assumptions on stiffness or complex finite element calculations. More on that in a bit. Often, the high confidence in the accuracy of the load in each strut can negate some of the risk of the single point of failure we discussed earlier. Anyways, I've been showing it a bit here and there, but here's a good look at the minimally constrained structure I mocked up. In this instance, we're mounting some sort of tray, maybe for electronics equipment or something, to this larger spacecraft structure. I decided to not model all of the clevises and attachments, but in a future video, I'll be designing and fully validating one of these parts for aerospace usage. That video will hopefully be up in a month-ish, so consider subscribing if that seems interesting to you. Anyways, you can see we obviously have six struts. On the body we're mounting, I use the four corners as strut mounting locations, and on the structure itself, I only use three points. Not for any real reason, maybe we can just assume some other structure or equipment is mounted to this corner here. I like to think of something like this as a 3 to one structure. At this point, we have three struts incoming or a tripod. At this point, we have two struts incoming or a bipod. And at this last point here, there's just one strut. Now. Onto the maths. Let's calculate the load in all these struts. What's great about these structures is that all we need to know is the geometry and acceleration, and we can calculate everything fairly easily. 
Whereas if this tray was bolted to the corners of the structure, we'd also need to consider how the structure moves and adds enforced displacement, stress, and strain to our body. That lack of enforced displacement stress is another advantage. For the third video in a row on this channel, let's turn to Newton's second law, F equals MA. Safe to say that that's an important one. As we already know, we have six degrees of freedom. F equals MA applies in three positional directions, X, Y, and Z, but what about the rotations? For that, we are going to consider torque, also known as the moment on the body. Basically, a torque is just a force at a distance L that induces rotation. If our center of gravity, also known as CG, is here, and our force is here, then the torque is the force multiplied by the distance. If we look at our F equals MA again, we can multiply both sides by length to get torque on the left, remove length from acceleration to get rotational acceleration, and finally add both length scales to mass to get moment of inertia. Thus, we get the new equation, torque equals mass moment of inertia times rotational acceleration. Mass moment of inertia is based on the distribution of mass in a body most CAD programs can calculate it for you very easily, but for now we'll just assume the spacecraft isn't rotating rapidly during dynamic events. This is a valid assumption under most circumstances, so we can say torque equals zero around all three directions. If we want to add in rotational acceleration, we just need to have our CAD program output the moment of inertia. Okay, now we can write six equations, one for each direction. Guess how many unknowns we have? That's right six unknowns, the force in each strut. We can measure the start and end point of every strut in the CAD program. You can see on screen, here's me doing that right now. Also, we need the 3D coordinate of the center of gravity of the body, and that's it. I put all of these coordinates in Python, as you can see here. Next, we calculate the vectors of all the struts, which is just subtracting the end point and the start point. The unit vector is acquired by dividing out the length of the strut. The vector from the end of the strut to the CG is calculated, which is basically our length for the torque. Now, onto some linear algebra. We need to create the matrix equation AX equals B. The X matrix is a 6 by 1 and contains all of our strut forces. The B matrix is also a 6 by 1 and is mass times acceleration in the top three and zeros for rotational acceleration in the bottom three. The A matrix contains all the geometry data and is a 6 by 6. Our three forces are very simple. We just need to sum up our six strut forces multiplied by the unit vector in that direction, which you can see here. The first three rows of the A matrix are just all the unit vector components. The torques are a bit more tricky because we need to do cross products. We take R, the vector from the CG to the strut endpoint, cross with the force vector to get the torque vector. I'll save you the math, but splitting it up into components gives this final answer. Now, this A matrix just needs to be put into Python, and here it is. The solution to AX equals B is to invert the A matrix and multiply it by B, shown in matrix form as this. This inverted A matrix is sort of like our general solution, and after calculating it, we can multiply it by basically whatever B we want or whatever loads we want to get the strut forces. I started by doing a single B matrix to give me just one set of answers that I could sanity check by making sure all the forces and moments come out correctly. Here I'm entering a mass of 200 and an acceleration of 3G in each direction, and my input matches my output. Hooray! All six struts have a fully determinate load. I intentionally omitted units for the tool because you can use whatever units you want as long as you're consistent. Also, I used matplotlib, a Python downloadable toolbox, to generate a 3D plot of the struts. This is great for checking to make sure you entered everything in right by visualizing the struts. Check out the two side-by-side, -side, CAD and Python plot, and you can see they both match. This actually already came in handy. I missed a copy paste when inputting all the coordinates and caught it because the 3D plot looked different. Okay, after everything was working, I wrote some new code to loop through a ton of different loads. For this example, I decided to pick an upward acceleration of 6G, a downward acceleration of 3G, and a lateral sweep of 2.5G to represent random vibration or lateral loads. 
And here are the results. On the left is the 3D plot I already discussed. The top right shows the user load inputs. Note the Z load goes from a positive constant to a negative constant, and both the X and Y loads sweep through many angles. Below are the strut loads. This is the real answer. It outputs exactly what the force in each strut is for the given load. You can zoom in and pan on this plot as needed to find the maxes or just output and use all the forces as is. Hopefully this is as exciting to you as it is to me. We took nothing but the geometry from CAD and we were able to calculate the load in every strut. These loads can then be used for a slew of other calculations ranging from buckling and stress analysis on the struts, clevis and ball joint analysis, and attachment bracket stress analysis, which will be the topic of the video I hinted at earlier. Anyways, that's it for today. Like I said, please consider subscribing if you think you'd like to catch that future design analysis and validation video. See you then.